Right, ladies and gentlemen, are we ready to go again? <laughs> Almost. While you're still sitting down, um, can I just say something about Slido? So it's like being at a fire hydrant with Slido. There are so many questions coming in. And what it would be really helpful to do is if you see a question that you particularly feel needs to be answered, then like it. Because by liking it, you send it up to the top of the inbox, as it were. Only otherwise, I'm having trouble trying to assimilate the huge number of questions that are coming in. Um, and you'll see that I've now resorted to paper. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, can I just apologize to all the ladies in the room for the huge queues uh, uh, at uh, the uh, uh, facilities downstairs. When will places ever learn that you need twice as many ladies lose? OK. Right, that's that over. Um, uh, uh, yes, <laughs> stop it. Don't let me go there. OK, so we've now got to diagnosis. So we were thinking before about brain health. More generally, for the general population, um, how can we alert people to uh, the need to take specific um, measures, like uh, to improve their brain, uh, brain health? Uh, we talked about the VN, or the VBAV number, as being very important. But now we're going to come to diagnosis. Uh, you know, brain disorders are very, very complex in their biology, and we still, frankly, don't know that much uh, about them. And diagnosis is based on symptoms. And so what this session is about is exploring whether digital technologies can uh, be used to facilitate timely and accurate uh, diagnosis. So let me introduce you to my cast of thousands, or rather, they're going to introduce uh, themselves. So just briefly introduce yourself and tell us uh, your thoughts on this. So hi, I'm Michelle Lax. Um, I'm from Ixico. Um, Ixico is a data analytics company based in London. Um, we focus on the development and optimization of neuroimaging and digital biomarker um, data analytics. Um, and the application of those in clinical development. So we work in industry-sponsored clinical trials, but also a lot in collaborative consortia um, work to further the development and validation of these biomarkers. Um, so, you know, there's a need for um, developing these technologies further um, to provide more accurate and um, richer brain structure and functional um, information. Um, but also, as the previous session focused a lot on, um, on including real-world data, so digital biomarker data um, um, assessment as well. Um, when we're looking at things like imaging, you know, it's uh, very discrete um, points in time over a trial or over a, a study, um, whereas um, real-world data can assess the patient in the home and um, provide a more richer data set. Okay, Corinne. Thank you. My name is Corinne de Vries. I work for the European Medicines Agency. And my short statement for this session is that this is a digital is an area where clearly there, is, there are many opportunities. And at the agency, we were quite surprised to see it combined with brain health, because brain health is an area where we have seen very little in terms of um, medicines innovation and major development. So our first question was, is this, um, are we laying down the rules for technology? semi-quoting Angela Merkel when she addressed the Harvard graduates two weeks ago? Or are we letting technology dictate how we do our research? So um, I'd like to start with a cautionary note like that. And then having said that, say, of course, we do see opportunities more broadly uh, in psychological and also neurological disorders. Um, we've recently opened up our guidelines on major depressive disorder, schizophrenia, um, and, of course, so there are opportunities, early diagnosis of suicide, uh, cognitive damage is important in various areas. So if we can develop a better understanding of brain functions that can be applied across diseases, that will be a very useful uh, area that we would see. And then a plea to combine that with also going back to the bench and, develop and identifying mechanisms of action and developing medicines innovation in the area. Thank you. Okay. Corinne. Uh, sorry, Victor. Good morning. My name is uh, Victor Yersa from Marseille. I'm the director of the System Neuroscience Institute uh, <coughs> at Ex Marseille University in CERN. Um, I'm also a member of the Human Brain Project, 
where I'm responsible for aspects of uh, modeling and a co-founder of the Virtual Brain Project. What we are doing is uh, mechanistic modeling. It's a brain network modeling where we are deriving and computationally constructing uh, mechanistic computational brain and network models of individual patients that allow us to use them as in silico platforms for personalized simulations of brain activation pattern. I'm not saying, I'm saying brain activation pattern, I'm not saying brain function, even though we all of us believe that brain activation, brain activity is linked to brain function and dysfunction. And, uh, this we use to uh, translate into clinical applications. Uh, our workhorse application at the moment is epilepsy, where we are individualizing or individually virtualizing uh, epileptic patients' brain models to predict seizure propagation patterns. This is a technology that has been approved for a clinical trial. Uh, it's a clinical surgery trial uh, that we are running actually as of today, as of this morning. It has been authorized, yeah, so that is very nice. Yeah. So uh, it, the same technology can be translated also to other applications, but this is still in baby shoes. Okay, thank you. Good morning, my name is Magali Haas. I'm the CEO of Cohen Veterans Bioscience. We're a US-based nonprofit research organization that is focused on accelerating the translation of basic science to clinical practice, uh, focusing on therapeutics and diagnostics specifically. Uh, we're very excited about this topic because we believe that, especially in brain disorders, we need to objectify diagnosis. Um, but uh, as we've been developing a number of translational platforms to facilitate this type of work, we've uh, worked on developing a platform for early signal detection, uh, um, looking at devices and, and their validation. Uh, we've been developing uh, big data analytics uh, solutions, how do you compute across this data, and a way of, of sharing data across research organizations as well. Um, I would say I'm also sanguine about what we need to do. There is a lot of sort of rolling up our sleeves work that needs to happen and, and, and fundamental investment that needs to be made. So I'm looking forward to this panel. And welcome to Europe. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Donata Kurpas, Associated Professor at Wrocław Medical University Poland, as well as Chair of the International Advisory Board of Europa, which is Association for Rural and Isolated Practitioners in Europe, Network of Wonka, which is World Organization of General Practitioners. As well, I'm a nucleus member of uh, SAP Association of uh, European Association of Cardiology, and I'm uh, strongly involved in uh, research on chronically ill patients. I already did notice that we had question about unmet needs of patients, but uh, I would like to underline that we cannot divide uh, patients from their caregivers what is especially important in patients with dementia. Uh, when we are, as uh, general practitioners, um, organizing management plan for our patients, we always have to involve uh, not only patients itself, but also caregivers, and it doesn't matter about which part of Europe and world we are speaking, and about which healthcare systems. Majority of them will be from family members. Uh, so taking care of the patient means taking care of the family and involving not only healthcare professionals, but as well social workers, uh, patients, organization, policy makers, and this is what I'm really doing during my clinical work as a regular GP and as a researcher. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, everybody. I am Paola Berberino. I am the Chief Executive Officer of Alzheimer's Disease International. I am Italian, uh, we are based in London, and we are an American company. And we uh, famously are uh, the advocates globally on dementia and Alzheimer's. So I've heard in the endless toilet queue people saying, are we talking just about dementia and Alzheimer's? I'm really sorry. 
Um, that is also my, my field of expertise, but it is a very important field of expertise, and a lot of progress is doing that. Now, just to put my intervention in context, at the moment, we estimate that only about 50% of people are actually diagnosed, to start with, in higher income countries. That goes right down to 10% when you're looking at lower and middle income countries. So there is a huge gap with diagnosis. Indeed, there was a report last year from OECD that focused on the higher income countries that say that the actual reality may, in fact, be much, much worse than that. So we advocate to the WHO. We just finished our report in which there was a whole chapter on diagnosis and how, in fact, the vast majority of governments are failing to address the diagnosis challenge to start with. So my interest here is that online diagnostics could be a real game changer. And we, as an organization that strongly promotes with a great grassroots development movement, the idea of anything that can make life for people with dementia and their family easier, are extremely interested not only to look at it in the European context, but also to see how Europe could do something to change this for the rest of the world, which is struggling. Somebody else this morning mentioned how in the American context, often they are surprised at how, how more, more advanced Europe is. But we also have contacts with a lot of people in the world, and we know that there are advances happening. The previous panels um, didn't speak about the fact that South Korea, for example, is having a, a giant program on prevention online apps. So, you know, there are stuff that is happening elsewhere in the world and we can learn those lessons too. So I hope it's going to be a bunivocal uh, discussion this morning. Okay, Emilia. Yes, um, I will be very short because it's been very long, but... Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm Italian, but I'm compensating. Sure. <laughs> uh, Italians, you love them, don't you? <laughs> yeah, well, it's just to create a little less uh, tension, you know. <laughs> so, uh, I work in Takeda, I'm a neurologist. I started about four years ago to develop the uh, digital strategy for neuroscience within Takeda, and actually I engage quite uh, deeply into the IMI. We are in four different programs on digital technology implementation. Key point is about uh, bringing a clinical endpoint into, uh, into digital, but not only, is a biomarker that are helping to better diagnose the patients into specific categories that may respond better to treatment. The key aspect of this approach that I'm trying to push this in, in the company is to use devices that can be scaled up to the real world, and therefore that are easy to use, and they are aligned with the needs uh, that are uh, in the everyday life, so they can be used every day. This is a very important also for company because by bringing very early information that can be relevant also in the marketplace, you can build a value-driven uh, 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 you know, discovery and, and development of drug that may reduce also the probability of error that we are so prone to, to get into. Okay, so let's, uh, let's crack on with this. Let's think about um, the doctor who has uh, in his uh, surgery, and let's talk about not a, a, a specialist, perhaps a GP, has a suspicion that something's not right, but no certainty. Are there any digital technologies, either Paola or Donata, that could help make a more solid diagnosis? It really depends about which doctor we are speaking with this with a half of hour for one patient or with this who has uh, five minutes for one patient's long queue waiting behind the door. And I think that's where we're talking. I think that's where we're talking. I think we're, by the time somebody has got into secondary care, they're really pretty sure that there is something wrong. So what we're talking about is people who mm, are, there's a suspicion over, there's five minutes, where were we? <laughs> okay, so just let's rewind a second. So I was asking Paran Donata about what happens when you have in a GP situation in primary care, someone that you've got suspicions about, but actually, you could do with some diagnosis, and can digital diagnosis uh, help? So, Paula. Yes, <clears throat> nice to speak after the terrible noise. <laughs> Um, as I was saying earlier, yes, online diagnosis would be terribly important for us. Um, think about what kind of difference could it make in lower and middle income countries. Preparing for this um, speech, for this uh, panel, I looked at a number of things on the internet that are available, and the panel before made the point, there's just so much 
available. And there is so little that is um, uh, available in a way that people can be sure this is a trusted advisor, a provider. So as I was thinking, what kind of ideas could this camel come up with that actually IMI could bring forward, one of them not only would be to develop one such test that is standardized, and again, the previous panel has talked about that, but for me, the biggest thing is that how you do deliver it uh, to the end user, because we are seeing increasingly a massive difficulty from um, the conception of something, the piloting, often these pilots are little things, you know, they, they do the pilot, then it doesn't work out, or it does work out, and no attention is paid at the dissemination of this. So even before we talk about digital, we have to look at that. And the other element that hasn't been mentioned yet is the element of patients. There is very little studies uh, looking at online testing and their validity, but there is even less from the point of view of patients and how do they rapport themselves with the online testing. And there is a lot of work around the patient-doctor perspective and whether online is actually better. So there is quite a lot that we can still do to uh, advance this thinking. I hope we can have time to talk about but it. But presumably what you don't want to do is you don't want people to use digital technologies, discover that they have risk factors, and because many of the brain conditions are very stigmatizing, actually keep that information to themselves. So you want to, there is no point sometimes in <laughs> developing these uh, digital means of diagnosis if that diagnosis is not going to feed through into the health system in an effective way? Um, this is such a good question. Um, there is also another element to this question, which is what happens when you've diagnosed yourself and you decide that you have it and then you panic and there is no diagnostic support, which for us is another tenet of things that you shouldn't do. You shouldn't do diagnosis if you don't have a plan for what to do after. But coming back to what you've just asked, Yes, there is a, a massive issue about uh, people self-diagnosing themselves and not being quite clear and keeping it for themselves. But that has to do with stigma. We've just finished this giant survey on attitude to dementia, and one of the pieces of work that we are starting to work with is with the International Labour Organization. Because people, and we have here Hilary Doxford that can speak about this much better than me, but you can be told by your doctor that you have to go home and pack your bags and stop working, and that is not the case. You can be active for another 10 years, and how right is that? Plus, all the issues that Donata was mentioning on caregivers that may have to pack their jobs and have absolutely no support. So that's another giant piece of work that comes hand to hand with diagnosis that we are working on. But we have a roadmap to some extent in genomics. So for instance, we're now seeing genomic information coming back to patients in a very uh, uh, significant way. And there is no capacity in the system for genetic counselors. And so we're having to think of having online chatbots, all those kind of uh, things, I mean, in order to accommodate that. Well, we obviously have a massive network. We, we um, have 99 member countries. Each country has a huge network of grassroots development. What we need is to be given the right information to give for each appropriate circumstance. So my point is, as we develop online tools, we also have to think of adding the element of dissemination of information so that then this information can still be dealt with by, by people. There's been a lot of revolutions in this area and we have coped with other ones quite successfully. Okay, Magali, I'm gonna to want to come to you because early interventions require early biomarkers. And what are the current challenges in using them to assess patients? Well, I think there are several challenges. Uh, first is the fact that we still uh, diagnose in our current clinical practice model based on syndromic classification nosology and criteria, which means that it's already a somewhat subjective diagnostic process, and that's the gold standard that we're supposed to then uh, relate our objective data that we collect from all of these devices against. So uh, that makes it very challenging. Um, also, uh, we would like to be able to diagnose people, in fact, not diagnose them at all, but rather track them over a lifetime, a trajectory, um, 
have their own data be their own control and, uh, and to be able to do that, we need better, more sensitive devices that can measure subtle differences in cognition and the impact of cognition on behavior um, over time. And, and those uh, types of devices and diagnostics are not, tests are not yet available. There are many groups that are, of course, working on this right now. Uh, let me get to imaging and to you, Michelle. Um, you know, imaging can help earlier diagnosis. I think we're pretty sure about that. But do we need more local, more frequently? What do we need? Um, so I think you're right with, with imaging. I think one of the um, uh, issues is that it's, it's expensive um, in terms of access to the imaging. So I think it's important that we understand um, the key biomarkers that you're going to be looking at um, for each individual disease. I think particularly in terms of um, additional work that's needed is really looking much earlier on in the disease and having more natural history studies and as Megali adhered to um, tracking patients over a long period of time to really see what is the, um, how you can predict the onset um, with imaging but also other, other biomarkers and also how you can predict um, the rate of um, progression of the disease once the patient's got it. So we need a far more natural history studies to establish um, to establish those um, series of events in different disease areas, particularly maybe looking at more rarer diseases as well, maybe um, more of the ataxias and looking at those disease progressions. And we don't really know the natural history of some of these conditions anyway, because we're not obviously looking yeah. at the whole population. Um, there's a good question here from Bart Schroeder. <laughs> Wave your hand, Bart. Hello, Bart. Um, well, 17 likes for you. Um, if we develop digital diagnostic biomarkers for brain health using data from uh, large population cohorts like UK Biobank, Lifelines, will EMA accept this? And I'm looking at you, Corinne. Um, so thank you for the question. And um, the answer is, in principle, we are open for business, yes. Um, we look at these things on scientific rationale. So if there's a solid rationale, solid scientific evidence base for using this. In principle, it is, the answer is yes. And then it is, okay, w what is good enough? And there are two ways in which you could do that at the EMA. So one is just coming up with the, all the evidence that scientifically, in the scientific and clinical community, this is working, this is established practice, and therefore we are behind the times when we are being difficult about it, or come for a qualification opinion where uh, you will get from the scientific advice working party, you'll have an opportunity to present your case and there is a discussion, uh, a dialogue. And I have to then issue um, a plea to bear with us because this is, you know, you're trying to then educate us a little bit as well as us trying to ask you the questions of, of probing the evidence. And there are 28 member states where the regulatory authorities need to be uh, convinced of this, but at the end of that, so there was, is a dialogue and it can be painful for super novel and innovative methods. If at the end of it, however, you do get a positive opinion, then immediately you've got all the member states green light for that this is going to be accepted um, in marketing authorization applications. And Corinne, do you feel that you have enough digital specialists within EMA? Because digital specialists, you know, sometimes there's a lot of people who've got a lot of experience in other fields, and the digital specialists tend to be, you know, early career. Are you recruiting more of those people into EMA? So that's a fair question. So the, um, there, are, there are two answers to this. One is EMA is, is strictly speaking the secretariat for the network. So we draw in expertise as required from wherever it is needed, not just in the EMA building. Um, so at the Scientific Advice Working Party, if there is not the expertise there, we will draw it in for the specific questions. Um, at the same time, of course, within the building, we need to have an understanding of this expertise. And you may be aware that we have relocated recently, and that has resulted Relocated? In <laughs> I can't think why. <laughs> Um, it has resulted. It's, you so might of course, have to move back. We live in hope. <laughs> um, it has resulted in a number of it's of staff losses, not as bad as it, you know we might have anticipated. But it's, we see it as an opportunity. Of, okay, let's now rethink and let's look at given what's happening in the 21st century and so on. Let's look at what kind of expertise we need to recruit. 
And um, so your question to that is, yes. Magali, just a brief comment on that, and I'm going to quiz Corinne yeah, some I, more. I wanted to follow up with you on the regulatory side. Um, so we often talk about evidence, and usually that comes in the form of RCT studies. But here we're dealing with devices and, and, uh, and wearables, which we're really using in a real-world environment. And I'm wondering, how are you distinguishing real-world evidence from RCT evidence in the context of a regulatory framework? Thank you. So um, you may also be aware that there is a new devices legislation um, being implemented or will be implemented soon. And it, it's interesting because at the agency, we, strictly speaking, our remit is medicines, not devices. But if there are medicines coupled with devices, it's another matter. Um, again, so when it comes to looking at the evidence from devices, if it is for diagnostic criteria and, and determining whether a medicine can be used in you know, how, what is the right target population for medicine? If that is based on biomarker qualification or biomarkers from, um, you know, generated from devices, di diagnostics through devices, that is part of what we look at. But we, we have this challenge that some of the legislation doesn't, it's, it's the devices authorities rather than the me medicines authorities that need to look at it. So we're looking increasingly at how can we work together with the devices authorities, how do we again get the expertise in house or in our committees and working parties to ensure that we do that appropriately? And uh, Corinne, ju just a, uh, we've talked about this before, but what about n not just the agreement and the uh, of the uh, side of the regulatory house, as it were, but where you actually say that something doesn't work? Because actually there are a lot of things out there that just plainly don't work. And what you don't want is you don't want individuals sneaking off to do the kind of the, the, the thing that doesn't, hasn't got the seal of approval to find out and then keeping again that information to themselves. How are we going to go about telling people what doesn't work? I'm not sure I understand the question. Precisely. So are you saying there is a device that is not appropriate for identifying the biomarker? Yes, it's that not we, appropriate. So if people, all we could, in that sense, I have to say we are slightly reactive. So all we do is we say if there's a, a request for a qualification opinion, it's, that tends to go through steps. So first we offer a letter of support. Yes, you're on the right track and consider the following. Then there is a qualification advice. And finally, there's a qualification opinion. And that's the qualification opinion, if it's a positive one, great. There could be a negative one. So we, we will issue a negative, but that's only if people ask us for our opinion. Um, yes, so there's a big yeah. issue here about what people don't ask you about, but also in getting out to people the negative opinions that you have, because otherwise people still go on claim, making claims, and actually it's in their interest to do so. And again, so we are, we are medicines, uh, yeah. agency. So for medicines, we do that for devices. It's, it's not up to us, I'm afraid. Okay, which speaks to an important point about the integration of devices. And um, I think this is an important point because uh, we find this globally, and I think Luca has referred to this very point in his um, in its uh, starting point. So th this is a new moment. You know, this is very disruptive to the uh, order of things. So unless we change the way that we look at that order of things, this is never going to work. So I'm thinking here, and Vivian, you were, may remember this, that in England, for example, the whole fraud issue has given way to eventually the police having to take on a, a, a proactive initiative and start listing all the things that are fraudulent. Because that approach of saying we are just reactive uh, met with consumers being very angry. And this is in part where we are getting here. The, the consumer market is gazumping all of this stuff. Medicine and devices now go hand to hand. I'm wearing one, which tells me how much I sleep and my heart beat, etc. And from that to becoming hypochondriac is a very little step. And how are we going to cope with that, which the other panel also tackled? So. I think this is part of what we should be studying, perhaps. You know, how are we going to integrate these things and acknowledge that devices now are becoming increasingly focused towards healthcare, food and healthcare, 
seem to be the two things that people are really interested in. So we cannot just avoid it. As Luca said, there's plenty of 19-year-olds in their bedroom creating app that may have absolutely no evidence base. What are we going to do? And how am I going to protect the people that I represent, the end consumers, the families that are panicking in a room thinking that this is a diagnosis and it disequates death or worse? So I answer because this is an idea for IMI. <laughs> Actually, IMI should do this. The, the building of a database of information that comes from patients uh, needs to have uh, some sort of reference uh, which is above uh, the local rules in a way. So IMI is in a terrific position because it's merging industrial interest, academic interest, patient interest. And the, 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 the application of a, a you know, methodology like intelligence, artificial intelligence or like vector learning machine and so on are as good as the data that you are putting into it. So the control of the quality of the database is a critical factor. Besides, uh, if we have a, a lousy device uh, that can be put and tested against, uh, you know, in a virtual manner against a, a correct database, can show that it's a lousy device, can show that the variance is too big, it cannot be reliably implemented. So by enforcing these sort of rules uh, in order to be able to use a database, which are more stringent than the one that you have right now, we may end up to have a kind of regulated way to impact on the quality of the outcome of this device and therefore cutting out all this the other. Uh, I don't know if it's a solution, but it's definitely something that we can aim for, you know, and have an IMI that is putting <coughs> 1,000 patients every trial that we'll be investing in in order to have enough information to, to drive uh, the data sets and the database for disease modeling could be a solution. Because I was going to ask you, Emilia, how you transfer these technologies from research, and there's an enormous amount of research in this area, how you transferred it to everyday healthcare, and you would have to have a very clear pathway to try and make sure that the, not only that they were based on reliable data in the first place, but also they did what they said. Well, one of the tricks is to use the devices that are already available. So basically, uh, we are driven by the consumer device approach, and that some of those devices are extremely high quality. They can be powered up by additional, you know, devices, and therefore getting more measurements. In fact, the, the tendency that we have is to use uh, this available device into early phase for exploring the possibility to see this device then applied in the everyday life. So the smartphone is already telling you a lot of things. So it's already there. We don't do any effort to bring this device on the population. It's already there. So we are exploring, exploiting what is available. The major problem is that these devices are produced by companies that have the accessible data, and therefore they can approach the same problem that we are interested to develop in no, their own way. So how can you beat uh, Google doctors? You know, the Google doctor is, could be a fantastic help to our diagnosis, you know, because uh, he, he based on several thousand million of people, if you want. I don't know if you're aware, but Google is running, uh, actually barely, a, a 10,000 people a clinical study to profile a DNA genetics and digital technology to see the progression in the early phase of the various disorders that are occurring with a certain percentage in the normal population. So is this database going to become a, a purchasable for people that want to see where is my trajectory into these data sets and then go back to the doctor and say, look, I did my test and they're telling me this. How can we respond? We, we need to have reference databases that are objectively recognized by all the authorities that said those are the kind of contests. And actually, if we in. don't catch up ourselves, what we'll find is that we have a series of proprietary databases owned by big tech Exactly. And that exactly. is really not where we want to go, I would say. I, I wanted to follow up on, on your uh, suggestion that absolutely this is an, IM, an opportunity for IMI to establish a database uh, that looks across, first of all, the performance of these devices and uh, sets objective criteria for performance, um, knowing what the standard is, putting all that information in one place, having them tested against each other so that we know whether or not they do perform similarly, um, and then also the clinical data that accompanies that so that we can know what is it, it is really measuring and, and against what gold standard reference uh, for technical performance. All of that data can be uh, made available in a sort of pre-competitive fashion. So a thing for IMI might be a, a bit like a million genomes, except that you are getting a million people across Europe 
Maybe you give them free devices. Maybe it's, that's the public-private partnership. And then you have a dummy data set that people can use to develop um, new uh, apps that, are th that will have solid data. But, Hello, Victor, let's hear from, from, from you about how science and technology are going to help in the issues that we've brought up so far. Right. Uh, I'll address it, but in a wider context of what we have actually discussed right here. And also it came up multiple times at the previous panel, where we have, uh, uh, there seems to be an agreement that uh, we need to build more uh, biomarkers and build bigger databases, and the word machine learning and artificial intelligence has come up multiple times in order to parse this data and classify this data. But before, so that will be certainly worth an investment. Um, but prior to the biomarkers, there is actually uh, another decision to be made, this, which is a data feature. And this is actually a choice of the uh, researcher or the cl uh, clinician, uh, choosing a data feature that is somehow relevant and not just only on a correlational basis um, uh, to the disease that we're actually talking about. And, uh, if you go through all the biomarkers that we have, uh, there is a very strong tend, uh, uh, trend, a very strong tendency that these are essentially static biomarkers. Uh, rather than looking at dynamic processes, they are capturing either some uh, structural anomaly or some number index that is going up and down. Um, but uh, when we look at brain dysfunction as we image it in human brain imaging data, in functional imaging data, which is our key characteristic entry point to uh, characterize, uh, characterizing the neural correlate of uh, dysfunction, then it's actually a dynamic process. And the world of uh, biomarkers that are characterizing actually dynamics and processes, so this is a hugely impoverished domain and uh, for a variety of reason, actually, uh, reasons, because it's actually very difficult to characterize a dynamics. And the co uh, co uh, co uh, collapse into uh, a few static numbers that are characterizing a certain abnormality is much easier. Yeah? And this is, a, when we go in a machine learning and artificial intelligence, very often it's implied, yeah, they can pull out these structures out of uh, the data, Actually, no, because you choose the data features, and if they are already kind of static, then all machine learning and artificial intelligence can do is perform its classification and extract the structures that are in there. Yeah? So actually, the step of sophistication that requires sophisticated algorithms, digital technologies, is actually proposing this, or we are working with this. Uh, it's a precedent that uh, is a prior step that needs to capture the complexity of these processes in a, uh, the dynamics of these processes, assign them an entity variable, some representation that we can actually use. Yeah? And then we can uh, do all this posterior imaging, uh, classification, etc., and uh, use it as classifiers. But there is a very, very important step that we need to do before, which is linked to uh, computer science, complexity, dynamics, etc. And we need to get this one under better control. Otherwise, we will move forward and we will continue rising in our performance, but it will very rapidly set right. Yeah? And we see this in the uh, other types of applications when we go into models, where we perform mechanistic modeling of processes, and then we run into the same issue. How do we do the validation against real-world scenarios? We have to do the collapse, uh, uh, choose some data features, collapse it into some quantifiers, and then we compare it. But there we run into issues that we realize, actually, the model is not identifiable based on these values that we want to uh, optimize. It's simply not good enough, and we, it's not sufficiently descriptive or explanatory, which means this prior step of uh, handling the data features that are actually um, informative about what is happening in the brain is uh, very impor important and we have not handled this satisfactorily. Okay, thank you. So let's go to some questions from the audience. Um, Hugh Marston, where are you? 
So um, Hugh's asking, and lots of people uh, wanted this to be asked, is should we continue to define and classify brain disorders by their symptoms rather than a modern quantitative biological approach? I can see that you've got an opinion on this, Magali. I do. <laughs> Thank you, Hugh. Um, I, I believe very much that uh, we need to revisit our entire ontology of disease um, and, and revisit it in the context of a data-driven approach, uh, much as um, Victor outlined here. Um, the, the critical issue, though, is that in order to do that, we need to have deep cohort phenotyped uh, populations, and given this issue of, of the temporal nature of dynamically changing variables, we need to be able to collect that data repeatedly, deeply over time. This is a very significant investment, and not one that's going to be done by one or another uh, stakeholder group. It, it needs to be done in, in a forum like this, like IMI. Um, and all that data, so you're collecting the digital, the omics, the imaging, the clinical variables at the same point in time so that you can relate it all together towards your, your computational causal model and then see what how that changes over time. That's what's going to do, redefine disease, much as has happened in cancer and other disorders, right, based on a mechanistic model and understanding. And we do have to be careful. I, mean, I was just thinking about the NUMS study. This was a study of, uh, of, of NUMS and looking at I can't remember what the sister's name was, but you know she was the brightest of the bunch at 101, and uh, sharp as a pin, and yet this was a study where all their brains were donated. She had just as much signs of dementia in her brain, but yet was still very sharp. And the thing that was the, the foreteller of her sharpness, as it were, was her writing ability at the age of... Uh, 18 when she entered the uh, when she entered holy orders so there are some things that we think we know that actually we don't know so we're on shifting sands because we don't know um, the natural history of some of these conditions or indeed how prevalent they are in the population in forms that never proceed to the full-blown diagnosis it's just uh, our dream of healthcare professionals that we can analyze and we can, we can structure everything, what is not possible. Each patient is different and we cannot focus only on biomarkers. And I strongly agree with our keynote speaker that well-being consists of as well social well-being and psychological well-being. Two patients with the same diagnosis will completely different with the same disease. And uh, two patients dealing may be similar with the same uh, um, disease will be affecting by completely different caregivers. And the quality of life of caregivers is uh, strongly affecting quality of life of our patients. And it's directly correlated with the direct medical costs. So it's just network of different uh, implicators, which we have to include in uh, our thinking about patients, caregivers, and the whole plan, uh, where at the end is not only the patient, but as well their families. So we have to, and this is another question from the audience, we have to have an integrated approach from prevention to people at risk, to diagnosis, to treatment, to cure. Because otherwise, unless we have that whole journey pathway, we're going to have fragmentation and silos of both um, care and um, R&D. Um, if I can take this one. Um, so an integrated approach, so to speak, exists. Um, there's been a huge amount of work done by us and the WHO in making sure that all of these stages mentioned in the questions are looked at holistically and, and in an integrated way um, through the application and adoptions of various governments of plans of dementia uh, and Alzheimer's. So obviously we are talking of a broader uh, group of diseases and not all diseases. I'm thinking, uh, you know, Huntington, I'm thinking epilepsy, some of them don't have specific plans and that is absolutely true. Um, but in dementia we do, and we already know that that is failing because only 30 nations thereabout so far have a plan, 
and the vast majority of those plants are not integrated. So the question is correct. So there is a, a difference between a theoretical approach that we do have and the practical implementation of it, uh, and crucially, the funding of it. And so far, we haven't had the case, unfortunately, of a successful uh, medication that has come on the market. But then when that happens, we will also have to look at payers and regulator issues related to that very uh, point. So I think we need to continue working toward an integrated approach. But certainly for me, this panel cannot be seen in isolation from the previous one, which where a lot of what we are discussing now was already laid out. And from the next one, which uh, will look at care and treatment, because of course this for me is all part of a flow. And to me, what I talk about with diagnosis is, is no different. I think the point that Donata was making, it's, it's really important though, and I, I'd like to repeat it, because yes, we've picked up the point that IMI could have a very good role with databases, but in a way we have to have a bottom-up approach and a top-up approach. So much as I say that the consumers are now gazumping the whole process and driving the thing, we do have a duty to start looking at a more organized, um, top-down approach on how do we want to look at this data that is available and how do we want to make it available to the end consumer. And there is much more we could talk about it, but I won't. Okay, um, so we have an agent provocateur for every one of our sessions. Uh, so would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, Raj Long from Gates Ventures. Uh, the question I have is really an integrated question from the previous panel. Can I sit down? Mm. Is that okay? Um, it's an integrated question from the previous panel and with this panel, and it's potentially a topic for IMI. As we hear, this is a very complex topic. We talk about biomarkers almost as a single tool, whereas I actually envisage it to be a tool, that to be a toolbox in which we're going to have multiple tools. Some of those tools will be driven by qualitative data that we see, which is a lot of the work ADI does and, and finger study in areas. Uh, and some of that will be quantitative data from the clinical research front, which will have endpoints and clinical endpoints. Collectively, is there an opportunity here, both for IMI, and I'll be interested in the, pa in, in the panel. Part of the problem we have is, in brain health, I don't think we have a gold standard for brain health. Do we know what brain health is? Can we say X, Y, and Z contributes to a healthy brain? I don't think we've answered that question. We can't even say what's normal. Exactly. So should we start, roll back a little bit in the context of sort of disruptive innovation or innovation disruptive, actually think, can we go back to basics and actually try and figure out what is a healthy brain based on what we know today? And that could be driven from prospective data which we're, you know, that we're planning to do in a lot of the IMI studies, but also companies. A subcomponent of that can contribute, but we're definitely not short of retrospective data. We heard this morning just how much data there is. So is there a possibility to bring those cohorts of data together and come together as a private-public partnership and define what is a cognitive healthy footprint? Whatever we know today, it doesn't have to be the end state, but based on what we have learned, what would a healthy brain be, both in a qualitative way as well as a quantitative measurement? If we do that, that could potentially be a product, and IMI can help us with that. It's only a product if it doesn't get to, it's, it's not, it's, it remains a product. Value proposition is, is not there if you don't get it to a patient. So there's two ways you could use that product and say this is one tool you can always measure. So if you're doing a clinical trial, you do blood pressure, vital signs. You go to a GP, one of the first things they do is take your blood pressure. So it's considered as a basic vital sign that's monitored. How does he know your blood pressure is going up? Because he takes it every time you come in to see him and he sees a creep up. He may not know the cause, but he knows that you're leaning towards hypertension. So in the same way, if you had a tool, a, biomark a marker tool, whatever that is, and you make that a normative standard that should be used when you go into primary care, it gets taken so that you actually have the ability to monitor decline over a period of time. Because for, for mental health, that's part of the problem. The ability, you're, you're not diagnosed often until you're symptomatic, and it's too late. So that could be one value. So are we going back to the VBAV number again? 
It doesn't have to be that. I, I think it's actually more than a number. I think it's, it's, it's more. But we can also use it with help from the regulators, get some input. It's a standard tool of measurement that you do just like you take blood when you go to a clinical trial, just like you take blood pressure. It's something you do in all clinical trials. So the, the latter would help us learn more because we can actually design and be able to query it. And if you use AI and, and digital te technology as it stands, we can glean a lot more than we do today because we don't do it. The former, going to the GP, is a fantastic additional tool to help diagnosis. He won't be able to diagnose something, but he can definitely monitor decline, right, in whatever platform that is, and then take the appropriate action of referral. So it's done proactively, as opposed to where we are today very often. It's symptomatic stage that we, you know, often this is presented. So a potential topic, I think, for IMI to think about this, but also for the panel. And do you see that information? I mean, effectively, it could be crowdsourced. And to do something that is actually very important, which is we need to take the public with us yes. all the time. Yes. So if you crowdsource the information right across uh, Europe, then actually you make, you make f people feel that they are part of the solution and not actually having a thing imposed on them. I really, I really want to jump on that thought because I think um, to bridge between some of what you said and what you said earlier, um, I think that there are ways that we can collect information directly from pa individuals. I'm not calling them patients deliberately. Um, and we could all have our own personal health record where we could be aggregating this type of information along various different lines, as you're suggesting, different indices of a health index. And I'm, I don't think we know. Uh, we don't know. And it's not something can be defined from a top-down approach. I don't think the medical community is going to define what is optimal, as you said. Um, it's, uh, it's, for, it's on an individual basis. But with that type of information, we might at least have a sense of and you're getting off your own trajectory. And that data can be shared voluntarily with your clinician, voluntarily with individual researchers, voluntarily with a de-identified database um, to inform the entire infrastructure. If I can add uh, something, is actually partially already happening in the way we are building clinical studies with digital technology because the match control group is always part of uh, the sort of comparison group. And actually, when you're using certain kind of technologies uh, for comparing gold standards, having the normal normative profile is the starting point to show that you are actually measuring what you're looking for. You know, if you use a smartphone for social interaction, you use, a, you know, functional uh, social scales as a referent point, uh, you build the correlative sets, uh, that, and then you can assess the changes in severity of uh, of the disease. So in a way, uh, when you build the database, the normative sets is imply or actually is a very important part. So I'm fully, fully in agreement. I mean, I think we've got a question there as well. I mean, it hasn't appeared on my list, but citizen science and relational approaches to health are growing rapidly. Can we afford to keep the traditional transactional approach to, based on RCTs? I mean, I think that's a, that's a very good point. Well, um, I think this is really what we are talking about in the panel. Uh, we, we can't. Um, so this is all what, what's happening here, that things are moving very quickly and we need to be responsive to them. And this is also, I can see, related to the question below about regulation is low. Um, the 14 likes question. Um. So, 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 <laughs> so just to, to give you that question in full, regulation is slow tech is fast. There are many solutions already helping people. Can we really afford to step back and try and superimpose regulations? I like that question too, because that goes at the heart of capitalism. That's an interesting. <laughs> so yes, I mean, th this is what happens. Think about what happened with the mobile technology. Um, you know, we had to create regulatory authorities that would look at mobile technology, its accessibility, its affordabilities. And yet, there were a lot of unintended consequences. I'm thinking of Kenya that managed to jump forward and not look at computers at all and go straight on to uh, communication technology as their way to do everything. Uh, and indeed, they had online banking before we had online banking. So um, 
we just need to be responsive and also, and this is getting back to the point, we need to be aware that some solutions may not come from this room. May, some solutions may already exist, like the South Koreans already doing this giant pilot, they call it pilot, it's incredible, on um, whether you can have diagnostics apps uh, deployed to the population. You can have brain test score and then go to classes on prevention. We were discussing this with Mia last month. Um, so this, this stuff already exists, and it may also be a point of communicating with those that already have them. Uh, but certainly, we will need regulation at some point, because, again, but, there is just so much in the market. But also, we do need the solutions um, that go further than that, because what if people don't act on findings? How, is, how are insurers, how are going to health systems going to deal with people who you know, have something that says they shouldn't be eating pies all the time, but they still eat pies. So it, 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 so there are things that we have to consider like that uh, um, with insurance and with all those things that actually might prevent people taking these, um, th these kind of diagnostic tests. But, but before we finish, I want to come to something which has been raised by a lot of people. And we started to talk about something which I would view as a synthetic data set. In other words, you have something which is uh, crowdsourced by many people and which is the data set which is of good quality data. Most of the apps and uh, other diagnostics that we see are SMEs developed. They've, they're the people who are developing this. IMI uh, uh, is not just big pharma, it's lots of small companies too. Is there a way that IMI could uh, create the right environment that SMEs could develop apps which comply with the healthcare requirements and standards that we need? In other words, that IMI is part of that so uh, the solution. No, I fully agree. That's exactly. You, you just answered the question. Ah. <laughs> but there is a point that even if IMI did that, um, how do we tell people that this is the right solution? So it's not as simple as that. It takes a huge amount of work in getting to people the fact that whatever is the right solution proposed by whatever authority, that that authority is trustworthy. There is a real chasm between the, the wider public, wherever they are in the world, and the regulatory authorities. So yes, we do need regulation, but we also need dissemination and we need clear information to get the right people. Just, just, just to qualify, we do not talk about the scientific value of what you're doing, you know, because this is what is discriminating between, uh, a, you know, a consumer healthcare device and something that is actually hitting the real uh, diagnostic uh, capacity of the device itself. So regulatory can help for that. IMI can give this kind of uh, support for reaching a certain level of reliability and became a reference point for this qualification. Because this is a, an aspect that, uh, considering that there are 400,000 apps now for healthcare that needs to be taken care of, people unfortunately are not rational. So the behavior of people cannot be taken for granted that if you know that you may have an issue, you do all the tests. Uh, you know, the apps should in a way, understand the problem associated with the disorder, be developed by experts, be developed in collaboration with people that already had the disease and therefore it comes in a certain direction. And you may have pirate, uh, you know, uh, apps that are driving the people crazy instead of helping out. Yeah. So how so can this be regulated is a really difficult concept. So condition. how can we regulate it? But also there's another aspect, which is how do we see the role of patient associations in diagnosis and its follow-up? Because you know, it, think about where we are with health systems, which are under enormous pr pressure, financially constrained, and here we all are saying, we've got these wonderful apps that are going to diagnose more and more people, and if you're a health system, you're going, help. You know, we can't cope. We can't cope with the number of people we have, and you want to bring on much more diagnosis. So. What are the roles, and uh, I'm looking at you, um, Donata, uh, what are the roles of patient associations? And that was also asked by Roland Poche. Where are you? Run away, right. And really, thank you for such question. We cannot speak about patients without patients. 
and we cannot speak about just eating pies because it does the top of iceberg. Yeah. It's about not only knowledge and education. We know already that it doesn't work. It's about skills. And it's about something what is under eating just pies. It's uh, about everything what is involved in this. Uh, yes, eating pies was a yeah, proxy. For yeah, <laughs> really. So you cannot just uh, say to your patient, just stop, quit smoking, uh, change your diet, uh, start uh, to increase your physical activity, because it simply will not work, especially when you, as healthcare professional, smoke, uh, uh, eat hamburgers and don't move at all. But it's part of the problem. So what we should focus on is just a common plan and it's negotiation between healthcare professionals, not only general practitioners, but as well nurses, physiotherapists, psychologists, um, all professionals who are involved in this process. Uh, and. Uh, Patients, because patients and the ones again, caregivers, I'm repeating this constantly because we are really neglecting caregivers from our healthcare systems. Uh, it's critical. Patients are our main stakeholders and they are our leaders when we are speaking about any management plan. It's not enough to put biomarkers together. We have to know how the patients are dealing in their circumstances with such clinical issues. Okay, I'm going to take one more question. C can I just... Uh, 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 uh. So, um, I want to take my, uh, uh, one more question, which is really for, uh, for you, Michelle. Um, uh, before I'm going to come to you to have your one thing that you want IMI to do, okay? So, uh, how, there's a question here from Paolo. Uh, how can we break imaging silos? There are millions of image records just sitting there in the various archive systems in hospitals. I mean, I think people are sitting on a lot of data in hospitals because they think that it might be gold, but they don't know how to turn it into gold, but they don't know what to do with it either. Yeah, I mean, it's very true. There's a lot of data out there, and we'd, you know, I'm sure a lot of people would love to be able to look at that data and analyze it, and it comes down to data sharing and being, you know, accessibility of that data. So, um, you know, anything we can do to bring together cohorts and registries of data um, with the, you know, the correct permissions to use it, to allow academics or you know, companies to, to look at that data, use it for machine learning, to further their AI al algorithms um, would be great. And I, I, I've seen some of that in some disease areas where they're collecting such data. Um, I've seen it overcome on some things. Um, for example, there's um, an Enigma study where they actually send algorithms out to the um, hospitals and they can run imaging algorithms on their data without it having to leave the center, um, but with the um, sharing of the results of that data. So that's another way we can do that. So it's um, okay. finding ways for sharing that data, finding ways to utilize. Okay. So I'm now going to come, you all, uh, come to you all, and you are going to be Pierre Moulin and his entire board, and you are going to decide the one thing that I am I going to do. So, okay, Emilio, let's start with you. <laughs> so, oh. uh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> no, no, sorry. Very good. So the, the one thing, yeah, we can go this way. So as I said, database, integrated databases with biomarker, digital technology, profiling normal population, and then uh, the initial phases of patients. Large databases to be used as a normative reference point. So I would per suggest a preference for this kind of project that brings together in different nation of Europe, those profile. You know, we know that the people walk in a different speed, so they have a different digital profile, and for something in a slow population is not, and if you are in Paris, you have to run, it's not really walking, you know? So it, it is normal there, but it's not uh, the same in the countryside. So in a way, it's quite important to build a database. It makes sense with the, you know, with the concrete context of the countries in which we are, and, 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 and Europe is quite differentiated. Okay. And this, the second point is about, uh, we are talking about people rather than patient. People with a problem, because we, we are discussing about the high risk people. We have to focus on the biomarker, the beginning of the disease that are being, building the condition of the disease. So I think that we have to change the mindset about patients. Okay. Um, I think we talked about online capacity to diagnose uh, behavioral, to look at uh, cognitive uh, decline, a lot of things that could be done with online testing. So I won't go back to that. But the last question 
around patients did also prompt me on another point, which is we are now looking with the London School of Economics in enormous amount of depth to seven countries' healthcare systems to look exactly at that point that you made earlier, which is once you get the diagnosis, then what do you do? So we need to be more specific, and IMI could look at what we are doing with these seven countries, none of which is European, and see whether they're interested in looking more in depth at how to apply this to the healthcare systems of Europe, because there is a model already there. Okay. So, uh, again, we need uh, not only the tool to diagnose uh, what we have now, but as well dynamic of the process and really progression and regression uh, in our people, not only patients <laughs> and their uh, families, and uh, as well support for healthcare professionals and other professionals which will be involved in care for. Uh, people. Okay. M Magali, what would you like to do, perhaps in Europe, that we might not be able to achieve in the U.S.? Well, in the U.S., we've been doing the precision medicine uh, and million veterans projects, which are deep phenotyping, large populations, 100,000 and a million people, respectively. I think something like that here in the, in the EU, under the IMI, would be ideal. I mean, we've got the Million Genomes Project, haven't we, in the EU, but other... Deep, okay. deep phenotyping. Deep, deep. Right. Okay. Victor. Good. Um, I have the mic, right? So <laughs> I did like the comment earlier about brain health. Thank you. That was a good one. And we can actually cut it down uh, uh, on the fact that uh, the brain health, it's a particular status versus diseased, and that has representations and activations, which will be multi-parametric. These parameters or variables are not independent. So they're codependent, and that spans so-called manifolds of codependency in uh, higher dimensional spaces. And this is what we need to develop, strategy to extract those manifolds from data to formulate them, so put in sophistication into our choice of data features and then build the databases and enrich them with these uh, multi-parametric methods in order to describe them, in order not to be naively there and just uh, increase one particular number. It's a multi-parametric, high-dimensional entity. Okay, Corinne. So um, a number of interesting suggestions have been made, which I would support, and I would just say that whatever you decide to do, given a number of comments you've made as well, is try and um, ensure that the diagnostics is coupled with the solution. So dynamic biomarkers take the point, but is there any product currently out there that isn't making it to the public because we haven't got the right biomarkers? Um, so that would be one plea to just focus, and sh you know, acknowledging that we by diagnosing loads more, we don't have a capacity to deal with loads more. Okay, let's focus first on where can we also offer solutions? Um, and always ask, is this a solution looking for a problem? Is tech, you know, have we got a research question where digital is the way to address it? Or have we got digital and we're looking desperately for a, a way to use it? I think that's a really it. important point. So those would be mine. Thank okay, you. Michelle. Um, so I suppose taking one step Taking one step back from um, with the diagnosis, having a, the treatment, but also as we're looking at some of these big databases and patient collection or natural history studies, as we're looking at some of the really advanced kind of biomarkers, how can they be translated into the clinical setting, into a diagnostic tool? So quite often we have very advanced analytical techniques, but actually in the real day life, they can't be propagated into a, a clinical tool. So making sure we're always thinking about that throughout all of these um, cohort data collections and... And there's also a, a, a thing, finally, about is there not about working with DG Connect? Because if you haven't got decent Wi-Fi or a decent <laughs> phone signal, you're stuffed. You know, a lot of digital doesn't work at all. So on that cheery note, uh, I want you to thank all our panel, and we're going to break for lunch.